Yes, we can now start this Euro Surveillance Seminar, which I am very happy to moderate. I'm, I'm Jette de Valk, and I'm uh, Associate Editor of Euro Surveillance, and so I have the pleasure of uh, moderating this seminar for you this year. And uh, the topic is uh, changing urban environments and its impact on infectious diseases, surveillance, uh, prevention and control. Um, why, why did we pick this, uh, this subject? Well, the urban environments, uh, urban, uh, urban areas are home to more than half of the people's population and uh, in Europe even more than three quarters. And, and these urban areas are expanding and they are constantly evolving. Um, city planners have to make lots of uh, organizational and infrastructural changes to keep these cities livable. And then with Climate change, for instance, there are huge effects to be uh, awaited and already happening, actually. And cities need to be made more resilient to, to increase temperatures and extreme weather events. And so uh, city planners have to deal with that. And also they have to think about, um, about uh, implementing and reaching sustainable development goals. So they have to think about carbon neutral neutrality, sorry, <laughs> curbing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, for instance, by optimizing public transport and making walk and bike lanes, and then the resilience to extreme uh, events and unexpected hazards, uh, m mostly related to climate change, they also need to be taken into account. And so one of the options is uh, creating green and blue spaces, green spaces being parks and access to forests and, and grasslands and blue spaces is access to water, rivers and lakes and, and seas and oceans. And, and it's clear that um, has been shown also scientifically that the access and presence of green and blue spaces is, is beneficial for health and well-being. But then there are also risks which could be uh, accompanied by these evol evolutions and changes. Um, no, uh, infectious diseases risk I'm talking about, in spite of all the benefits it can have. And like if we think of optimizing public transportation, perhaps it has an effect on respiratory diseases. Green spaces could have an effect on, uh, on vector-borne diseases and blue spaces on waterborne diseases. So, all this requires a lot of reflection and anticipation. And this is why we thought uh, we need also to contribute with surveillance and, and take into account the impacts on that. And we need to reflect on this and see how we should take all this into account. So before I will introduce to you the speakers we have who have very uh, extensive experience in these matters, I would like to invite first Andrea Amon, who would like to address a welcome word before we continue with the session. Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you. So it's a welcome word, but it's also kind of a reflection because um, as you're aware, um, uh, I will uh, leave ECDC uh, uh, next year. And I wanted to uh, give you sort of a kind of a summary of my interaction and involvement with, w uh, with um, Eurosurveillance. My first involvement was uh, in 96, 97 as an author. And then I became a reviewer. When I came to ECDC, I became an associate editor, uh, as, as uh, yet now is. And then um, after um, uh, some, some time, I also filled in for Ines as editor-in-chief when she was on leave. So I have been involved in Eurosurveillance in really uh, almost all the angles. Um, also starting from um, or, or ending, more, more or less ending, with uh, um, as ECDC director to ensure that your surveillance has the editorial independence that um, the journal needs and that also everybody was uh, clamoring for when your surveillance moved uh, to, to ECDC. 
So I, I, I think I, I did that. I never um, intervened in any of uh, the editorial decisions that uh, Eurosurveillance made. Um, and this is also an item that I will put in my hand over to my successor. Um, just a few words on my uh, on the today's seminar. The topic, uh, as uh, yet has uh, introduced it, fits into the theme that we have um, by bringing some of the future challenges and new methods that we have to deal with uh, on the stage. Um, you will hear from Herion about uh, our foresight program uh, that uh, we have. Um, um, uh, established now. Uh, it, the idea is that um, uh, I, to identify drivers that could uh, be um, uh, have an influence on how our world in uh, some decades from now would look like, and um, then put together scenarios how these uh, different drivers could play out. Now, the idea is not that these scenarios are what will happen, but that uh, we, we discuss and look what could we do today in order to positively influence some of these um, scenarios. So in essence, uh, in my view, these, uh, these scenarios should be help for us uh, what to prepare for. And uh, the, the topic of urbanization is one of, uh, of the key drivers. You have already heard, um, I mean, uh, many of us have also experienced that the uh, um, cities uh, have become like, like heat traps uh, in, in some, some regions in, in Europe or in the world, and uh, that the countermeasures uh, uh, equally have, uh, uh, could have uh, um, influence on um, the, the occurrence of infectious diseases. So I'm very curious on the, on the um, uh, discussion, the presentations and the discussion today, and how it may take us uh, to um, uh, some ideas how to behave in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. And so we have uh, two speakers with us today. There is Florence Fornet, who will be the first speaker, and she is the research director of the French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development in Montpellier. She works in a research unit for infectious diseases and vectors ecology, genetics, evolution, and control. And her research focuses on the relationships between environment and health in urban settings. So very appropriate to our team. And she has a lot of experience with malaria and arboviruses, mainly in Africa as well. And since 2022, she works and studies on, she studies and mitigates the impact uh, of urban greening uh, initiatives on vector-borne diseases in South France. And then we have Harion Ikink, is working at ECDC, is the principal expert of public health foresight and determinants at ECDC. And he works there on the ECD Foresight Program, which Andrea, Andrea men mentions. Um, and he has an interesting background. He started as a biomedical research scientist, if I'm correct, as a PhD in molecular genetics and personalized medicine, and then a long career in many, in the Dutch government, but also in European agencies, and like he was policy, uh, um, sci scientific policy officer at DG Santé, and worked also at HERA, and even other agencies, but it's a long list. <laughs> So we're very happy to have you here. We will have two uh, presentations. We would prefer to have all the questions at the end. If there are immediate questions for pressing clarification, we can take them in between. So please put your questions under the question tab and the comments in the chat. And if possible, also try to summarize your questions. This will really help them to, to get them all together and identify them. And uh, there is also a possibility of taking questions from the room. So if you prefer to stand up for those who are present, that is also possible. There are micros available. 
So now I would like to, to uh, pass the word to Florence Fournet, who is going to present to us uh, her work and about green cities and what do we have? Green cities and vector-borne diseases, the emerging concerns and opportunities. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I have the mic. So good afternoon everyone, I'm pleased to be here with you today and uh, I thank the organizer for inviting me. It gives me the opportunity for sharing with you some emerging concern about uh, vector-borne diseases, uh, not only uh, for humans but also for animals and uh, plants uh, that arise from, uh, because of urban greening. So, as you know, uh, since uh, 2007, um, cities have surpassed the rural, the rural areas in terms of population, reaching 4.4 billion of urban dwellers in 2020, and this figure is expected to double by 2050. In Europe, uh, there are more than 75% of people who are already live in urban areas. This, uh, uh, the urbanization uh, is uh, resulting in the consumption of natural and agricultural areas. And by 2030, there will be an additional 1.2 million square kilometers of urbanized areas. This means that the urban area observed in 2000 will be tripled by this date. And this represents uh, an additional increase of 100 10 square kilometers of urban area every day. And this uh, expansion uh, results not only in, uh, in the loss of habitats, but also in their fragmentation, and that leads to the loss of biodiversity. Of course, cities are the place of uh, numerous pollutions. Impervious surfaces are uh, originated from, uh, to produce urban heat in Iceland. And in large cities, temperature can be higher than five uh, Celsius degrees on average. Cities are also the vulnerable to the, the impact of climate change, such as flooding and also uh, water scarcity. And the urban fabric is uh, producing uh, many inequalities not only in terms of housing, as you can see on the, the picture, but also in terms of access to services. Then, uh, incorporating more greenery in the cities seems like a way for improving the situation. Greening cities support ecosystems and enhance their resilience, meeting biodiversity, pollution and climate challenges. Greening city is a nature-based solution developed to cope with the UN Sustainable Development Goals to make cities inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. Since 2015, the EU has been committed to meeting global goals aimed at sustainable development for everyone, everywhere by 2030. And uh, the, the packet of Amsterdam, sorry, adopted in 2016, was a key milestone in ad the adoption, in the development of a uh, shared EU-wide approach to urban challenges. And as you can see on the graphic, the, the proportion of urban area covered by tree canopy uh, regarding the data collecting in 2018 show, in fact, uh, great disparities among uh, European cities. So, nature-based solutions are defined as action to protect, sustainably manage and restore natural or modify ecosystems which address societal challenges effectively and adaptatively, simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. There are two types of uh, nature-based solutions. First, existing area that can be used to provide ecosystem services while also being maintained to protect and increase biodiversity. And second, areas that can be designed and constructed to support the ecosystem. 
urban ecosystem benefits from nature-based uh, solutions through the ecosystem services they provide. So we can have uh, an improvement of the soil quality, an enhancement of biodiversity. Nature-based solutions can also reduce noise levels and reduce urban heat effect, uh, urban heat Iceland effect, sorry. We can also uh, note an improvement of the pollination, the capture of air pollutants, and NBS contribute also to food provisioning with urban gardens. And greening policies ultimately contribute to human well-being by providing these above uh, ecosystem services. But not only. Uh, access to natural areas to the, that impact uh, the, the, the noise, the reduction of the noise is observed, and then it could impact uh, the stress that could be reduced. And then, ultimately, we have an effect on the mental uh, health. Also, uh, providing uh, spaces where people can have a physical or recreational activity, nature-based solution can induce um, a reduction of the burden of respiratory diseases and also cardiovascular diseases. And uh, some studies even go as far as conclude an effect on mortality. But numerous studies highlighted the challenges associated with comparing sites, methods, and the quantity and the quality of green infrastructure. And uh, it is therefore difficult to conclude that urban greening has a causal effect on the human health. And also, um, urban greening can, uh, have, can induce a potential harmful effect on health. For example, emissions of volatile organic compounds by urban tree may increase ozone formation. Air circulation can be restricted by tall roadside vegetation. Pollen emission by plants is, of course, among the ecosystem disservices having the greatest impact on health. Inequalities may also increase because of unequal access to green infrastructure. In fact, Uh, green infrastructure are often uh, more introduced in high-standing uh, neighborhoods. And interaction between humans and wildlife can be conflicting. For example, the presence of wild boar in cities is not always well perceived. <coughs> But what about arthropod-borne diseases? Arthropods with potential health risk, it means uh, mosquitoes, sandflies, and ticks, are often overlooked. Urban green species may facilitate the emergence and the spread of vector-borne pathogens to humans by local increases in vector or in reservoir diversity and abundance, by boosting human exposure as more people are engaged in outdoor recreation, and Also, diseases can concern humans, but also animals and plants. Let's uh, have a look at some examples of the impact, the potential impact of urban greening on uh, vector-borne diseases. Uh, in the summer 2014, the Tokyo experiences uh, an outbreak of uh, dengue which was uh, centered around a urban park, the Yoyogi Park, where the, the density of the vector, uh, Aedes albopictus, and, uh, it, uh, was very high, and this vector was also found infected. And uh, the, the question around the mosquito-borne uh, diseases can be also asked for West Nile virus. Uh, we have uh, mammalian and human cases of uh, West Nile virus in uh, rural areas, of course, but uh, there, there are also cases in uh, urban areas. And for example, this year, we have uh, human uh, West Nile uh, virus uh, cases in uh, the city of Bordeaux uh, in France. So um, the, the last technical report of uh, ECDC about uh, West Nile and uh, Uzutu virus 
have highlighted that uh, urban setting as power can be the, the place of uh, local transmission. So this threat has to be considered uh, with attention. Other example, in, uh, between 2009 and 2012, uh, Madrid experienced uh, an increase of uh, leishmaniasis cases in uh, humans. And uh, upon investigation, it was found that uh, the surge of uh, cases was linked to the development of an urban forest in the surrounding of Madrid, which have increased the density of the vector, uh, sandfly, the Phlebotomus perniciosus, but also the, 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 the density of a novel host, the R, and uh, wh why, uh, why that the, the human contact with vector and animals was um, increased. Linking uh, urban uh, parks and uh, forests by uh, ecological corridors or green network can also favor the introduction in the cities of some uh, wild animals, like, uh, for example, here, the, the deer, but also fox or wild boar. And these animals can come in the city with their ticks, and these ticks can be uh, involved in the, sick, the cycle of transmission of uh, tick-borne diseases, like uh, Lyme disease or tick-borne encephalitis. And it is interesting to note that uh, in 2012, more than uh, around 50% uh, of the tick reports uh, from the CTIC platform came from private gardens. So, of course, at this time, people were confined at home and uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemics, but uh, no one has suspected such uh, important density in, uh, in these private gardens before. Uh, the Wang Longbing uh, disease is one of the biggest threats to citrus crop worldwide. And uh, the, in, the probability of the introduction of the HLB disease in Europe is, uh, is high because uh, one of its vectors has been already identified in Portugal and in Spain. The Californian uh, study uh, showed that the, 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 the presence of the vector of the, this uh, bacteria was found in uh, urban private gardens uh, in cities which are surrounded by uh, citrus uh, orchids. And uh, they suspected that uh, there is a, a circulation of the, 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 the pathogen and the vector between the, the center of the cities and the, the, crop, uh, the citrus crop outside. And this question can be also uh, asked for regarding uh, Xidella fastidiosa, which is a bacteria uh, responsible of the pierce disease for vineyards. And um, the, the pathogen has been already identified in Marseille on ornamental plants. Uh, which can be uh, introduced in uh, urban uh, private uh, garden. So the, 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 the hypothesis of the, the, the circulation and the, the possible transmission of uh, plant disease from uh, inside the city to outside the city is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is to consider. So uh, what question should we ask? We have to, uh, to know what is the role of green infrastructure in relation to arthropods. Do GIs increase vector abundance and diversity? Do GIs serve as a breeding site for mosquitoes, for example, or as a resting place or as a source of plant nectar for these mosquitoes? Do GIs promote contact between humans, animals, vector, and thereby enhancing infection risk? How do vectors, hosts, pathogens circulate in the GI uh, network? And do the uh, enhanced biodiversity of vector and host can dilute the transmission risk? Is the impact of, uh, on arthropods the same whatever the GIs? 
We are talking about forest, park, green wall, green roof, and we can ask if, for example, a small green patcher, many small green patcher, have the same impact as a large uh, green uh, patch, for example. And so, um, to, to answer this question, we need uh, first supporting data. Uh, we need also a more comprehensive definition of uh, green infrastructure in terms of uh, size, plant diversity, and also surface extent. Development of consistent protocols for collecting entomological but also environmental data and comparing variables like uh, temperature, relative humidity, of course, but also landscape metrics are particularly needed. We have also to explore the factors that influence arthropod biodiversity and their role in pathogen emergence and transmission. We need also to better define the risk according to the context. It is not the same thing if we are talking about nuisance or if we are talking about disease. And uh, to assess the risk of uh, VBD, we need to design robust indicators. Implementation of long-term monitoring is essential. And also, the collaboration with policymakers, urban planners, health stakeholders, and civil society. Because if we are thinking about, uh, if we are seeking about a solution, we have um, to know if this uh, solution is acceptable for, for everybody in the city. And then we have to co-construct this solution. And we think that uh, citizen science may be a useful tool for this, uh, this collaboration. Uh, I talked previously about uh, CITIC, which is a French platform dedicated to the tick reporting. But uh, for example, here in uh, Spain, you have a Mosquito Alert mobile application, which has been developed by uh, the team of Frédéric Bartoumeus in uh, CAAB. And for example, this uh, mobile app uh, allowed people to uh, localize uh, mosquitoes, breeding sites, even bites. And uh, this kind of tools can give us uh, a, a large view of the, of the problem, can uh, help us in the surveillance and also to have a prevention action. So in conclusion, uh, we can say that a greening city is not an option. The potential hazard of urban greening should not be a reason to shelve this urban planning concept because it is a good concept. The effect of urban greening on vector risk need to be explored further to prevent them. Urban greening should be considered as an opportunity and a tool for sustainable risk management. Raise awareness and involve the city's various stakeholders in identifying solutions to prevent vector-borne risk is essential. And of course, interdisciplinary and intersectoral approaches are needed, addressing the interconnection between human health, animal health, and the socio-ecosystem. Before concluding, I wanted to show you this uh, picture. It's some uh, super green uh, building uh, in the, the large city of uh, Chengdu in uh, China. And these buildings were more or less abandoned by their inhabitants because of an incredible nuisance for, by mosquitoes. So I think we have to, to think to not uh, arrive at this situation. So thank you for uh, your attention. And don't miss uh, coming to Montpellier in October uh, 2024, sorry, uh, to uh, take part in the European Society for Vector Ecology uh, conference. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Florence. This was a very, very clear presentation. I don't see any uh, questions uh, in the app for uh, immediate clarification. Do think of questions and put them in the app to be treated afterwards, because we will cover both uh, presentations uh, in the discussion. So then now I would like to open up to an even wider angle, 
Uh, and uh, Garyan Ikink will now present on uh, exploring changing um, um, urban environments, even larger, in different future scenarios through foresight. Yes, thank you. So, uh, indeed, I would like to uh, expand the view a little bit on this uh, topic, um, by, uh, but, but first also introduce the ECDC foresight program, um, what foresight is, because it may not be clear to everybody, uh, why we are doing it and how it could be useful, for example, to explore topics like uh, changing urban environments and the consequences thereof of, uh, on infectious disease threats, for example. So why are we doing a foresight? Well, um, the main answer is basically uh, we don't want to stumble blindly into a uh, changing future and we also still want to protect uh, citizens from infectious diseases in 20 years' time. And we have been doing um, uh, future explorations already uh, uh, before, uh, but more in an exploratory and, and less integrated way uh, into, in, our, um, in our ways of working. So during the pandemic, we learned that we have to actually look further uh, ahead into the future and also wider outside of our direct area of expertise to become more anticipatory, um, proactive and resilient. And actually, this is also covered in our updated mandate. Uh, so we are using foresight to prepare for future threats uh, and inform our uh, strategy and operations accordingly. At the same time, we also want to create a sort of a culture shift, uh, both in our organization and with our partners, uh, which helps a more anticipatory and wider uh, internal and external collaboration, uh, as well as a sort of a, a, a systems and future thinking mindset, which we try to achieve with uh, participatory approaches and capacity building activities. So what is foresight? Um, Basically, it's an umbrella term for a large variety of uh, approaches and methods that are uh, future forward-looking, basically. Uh, and because we don't have data of the future, of course, because it hasn't happened yet, we, um, it, it, foresight is more of a, a, an, an intellectual, uh, collective intelligence tool, uh, sort of informed speculation about the future, if you will. And it all revolves around change. So we start with identifying change. So what is the change that is coming our way? Then we interpret what those uh, changes will have as a consequences on, for example, our work. We imagine change. So what kind of de developments uh, do we imagine uh, will happen towards the future? So, uh, and then we try to act on it. Uh, so really the a key point of, of foresight is that it starts action. It's a, it's a start of an intervention. It should not just be a academic exercise. Uh, and foresight does that by combining uh, evidence, uh, expertise, interaction, and creativity. So how does it look like within ECDC? Well, many of our activities are centered around the present, uh, a little bit around the, the near past and the near future. But even if we're looking at for, forward-looking activities like forecasting and modeling, uh, we can only do that uh, robustly for a couple of weeks or months, maybe a few years in the future. Um, Foresight really tries to take a step a big step from there and uh, really look from 10 years in the future and further. Uh, and that to inform policy options, strategy, uh, preparedness, and those kinds of things. Um, and how we're doing that, the, we have a current ongoing pro, uh, project where we start in the, the present. Uh, we do a mental time travel to 2040 and then uh, work our way back to the present. Uh, where we started with looking at what are the big uh, changes we already see happening in the world, so called megatrends. And here you can think about climate change, for example, about hyperconnectivity, about aging populations, for example. Uh, from there, we've looked at uh, underlying driver, uh, driving forces of change that are relevant for infectious disease threats and our mission uh, more broadly, so public health more broadly. Um, and we've looked how these may develop to 2040 and how they, they influence each other. 
And like I said, for, Foresight is a collective intelligence tool, so we've, we've used, um, we, we've, we've worked with a, a large variety of internal experts in ECDC, but also external experts, uh, sometimes in areas which we normally don't really uh, engage with a lot. And we identified these 10 drivers of change that are uh, most relevant for public health towards 2040. So these are um, impactful uh, drivers of change, but also uh, ones where we think there's a lot of uncertainty or how they will develop and pan out. And as you can see, there's a quite a, a big variety uh, in, the, in the drivers. And also only one of them, the, the, the bottom one, uh, antimo antimicrobial resistance, has directly something related to with infectious diseases. So it's indeed broadening uh, our view of threats. Uh, so for each of these, we've looked at, uh, we've defined what is the most likely pathway they will take towards 2040, and also what are alternative, still plausible pathways we should also take into account. And let's unpack one, for example, for this uh, session, most, uh, most uh, suitable would be urbanization. Uh, we can see already that there are some challenges and opportunities for disease prevention and control here. For example, we see sprawling cities encroaching into natural habitats, which has increasing risks for uh, zoonosis and pathogen emergence. Um, of course, high population den density and mobility will have an impact on the spread of infectious disease, uh, 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 respiratory uh, infections, and the rates of the, they sp uh, how they spread. Um, Opportunities are that if you have a lot of city, uh, people together in the city, um, you are, uh, it's easier to roll out, for example, vaccination programs, or uh, you have opportunities for new, new types of surveillance, like uh, wastewater surveillance, like we heard about this morning. And of course, people are living closer to uh, healthcare facilities, which will also be beneficial. And we just heard Florence also speak about heat island effect. Uh, that is a, a thing, especially during heat waves, uh, which will be more um, stronger in, in, in cities and will increase population vulnerability. So already here we can see there are some links with other drivers of change. Uh, so for data collection, for example, or pressures on, on, on uh, ecologies. But also um, if we think about cities, uh, they usually attract uh, different kinds of people or migrations. Uh, uh, migrants often uh, end up in cities first. Uh, and often uh, they're living in, in poorer living conditions. There are social, cultural, and linguistic barriers. Uh, so that will all uh, have an impact on uh, inequality to access to healthcare, for example. And if we think about climate change, both uh, adaptation and mitigation strategies, um, think about uh, flood or drought reservoirs we have in cities will have an impact on water quality. Uh, so possible diseases there uh, and also um, uh, disease factors. And also, if we talk about climate change mitigation, there's more and more uh, requirements for, for buildings to be well insulated, but of course that will have impact also on ventilation, which in turn has an impact on respiratory infections. Uh, so we can look at each driver independently like this uh, and already come up with very good uh, um, uh, consequences we could consider for infectious disease threats. But like I said, there's, many of these drivers are linked, so it's actually better if we take them together as a, as a collective um, uh, set uh, where, we can, where we also take into account where they influence each other. And that is why we have developed uh, future threat scenarios. So we basically have looked at linked uh, drivers that influence each other. Uh, all their alternative pathways we consider plausible. And then we look at sort of coherent pathways towards a particular future. And those are then formulated in what we call a scenario, which is basically a narrative or an image of the future, how it may be in 2040. Uh, so yeah, this basically answers the question, how do connected driver directions shape possible futures? And we're talking about plural futures here. So how does it look like? Well, we have identified six um, or developed six future scenarios for 2040, and they're quite diverse. Uh, I won't go into detail on all of them, but I would just like to say that they're, um, as you can see, they're quite diverse um, and that 
is because they have taken, they're based on alternative pathways of, different, of these different drivers. Uh, what is important to mention here is that they should not be seen as predictions. So although there are uh, plausible images of how the world may look like in 2040, we actually don't think that any of these scenarios will be the reality of 2040. But what we do think is that elements of each of these scenario will be part of the reality in the future. And that's why scenarios are a useful tool to holistically bring together the complexity of different drivers interacting with each other, while also keeping it manageable to look at one um, uh, set of uh, developments uh, in, in, in isolation within a scenario. So let's go a little bit deeper into two of these scenarios. Uh, first one I want to discuss is uh, building back nature, uh, which is uh, a scenario where the dominant paradigm is basically nature first. So uh, we live within the powers of, uh, of nature. Um, international cooperation in this scenario is led by coalitions in the global south, with the EU weaker internationally, but has more influence within Europe, and that includes in public health. There is a strong focus in societies on nature-based solutions, sufficiency-based policies, and sustainability-oriented actions. So if we put ourselves mentally uh, in this kind of world, what does that mean for infectious disease uh, control and prevention? Well, we can already see some challenges and opportunities, and France uh, highlighted uh, several already, uh, especially if we see in this scenario a lot of greening of cities. Of course, that increases the spread of, uh, or possible, possibly the spread of infectious uh, disease factors. Uh, bringing livestock uh, and nature more into the city increases human and animal health con uh, animal contact uh, and self-sufficiency communities, um, people bringing food production closer to home can have impacts on food and waterborne diseases uh, and also pests that are attractive can also infect uh, food uh, sources. Then, of course, if in this scenario we uh, are assuming that people have a more nature-based focus and uh, there's, a, there's an anti-movement against globalization, we could imagine that uh, vaccine and medicine supply chains are hampered somewhat, so they could lead to shortages, and also maybe some resistance to uh, synthetic uh, vaccines and medicines because people would prefer nature-based solutions. Uh, rewilding of areas will lead to more contact, possible new disease emergencies uh, and, uh, and other reservoirs. But as Florence also pointed out, societies will be more resilient as air quality improves and if you have green, um, uh, green areas in cities, brings more moist in the city, uh, cools down the city and um, uh, leads to uh, counteracting the heat island effect. People are more likely to um, to go out in nature, so more physical activity, and uh, also improvement of mental health, as Florence also just uh, pointed out. So going to another scenario uh, where we take the urban, changing urban environment in a slightly different way. So this scenario um, describes a society that is highly digitalized, highly urbanized. Um, people seek refuge in the engineered safety of cities to um, um, uh, to basically uh, f feel safer there. Um, it's a very tech, high-tech driven, youth driven, uh, but because of that, uh, there's a likely that there's an ex exclusion of uh, older populations and uh, people that are not so tech savvy. Uh, because of different uh, crises in the past, um, uh, people are more frustrated with mainstream uh, ways of living and that has posed uh, issues for traditional governance institutions and actually cities are more powerful now in this scenario than uh, nation states. So also here, uh, look at, looking at the challenges and opportunities, we can uh, assume there is higher transmission rates because uh, more uh, cities are more dense, there's more mobility. That can be partly counteracted because uh, digital society is more likely to have more remote work but that, as a consequence, has uh, that people are likely to have less physical activity. And there may also be problems with inequality of people that can and cannot remote work because of the nature of their work. Uh, high pressure on centralized uh, healthcare facilities, 
uh, could have impacts for, on, uh, for example, uh, antimicrobial resistance, healthcare-associated infections, and that, of course, has impact on access to healthcare, uh, although that can also be maybe counteracted in this uh, scenario because e-health will likely be higher. Uh, encroachment into, uh, of cities into natural habitats, again, uh, pathogen reemergence, and cities are likely to attract peri domesticated animals like uh, pigeons and rats, for example, which could carry uh, potentially zoonosis or uh, contaminate food sources. And then finally, this is nothing not anything specifically to do with the urban, urban uh, environment, but because it's a high-tech society, uh, we could assume that uh, gene editing tools, for example, are more advanced, uh, which has opportunities for drug development and therapy, uh, maybe also to using gene drive to um, uh, eradicate disease factors, but of course that may also have unintended consequences we should take into account. Um, and maybe you're thinking now, well, this is all nice speculation, but so what, right? Um, and that's actually where we are now. So I won't, I won't give you a lot of answers at the moment. Uh, foresight at this stage especially is more about asking the right questions. But um, what we are doing now is we are placing ourselves in each of these uh, future scenarios, thinking about how would a still effective ECDC and maybe other public health uh, partners should look like in this scenario to still be effective. And then we backcast our way to the present. So what kind of steps and actions should we take already now to get to that uh, ideal future attributes? And um, although it's early days, uh, we're still uh, working on that for the next uh, six months or so. I already want to uh, give some early reflections which we had uh, in discussions with experts. For example, we should liaise maybe more with directly with cities. Um, promote collaboration between uh, health and urban planning uh, and infrastructure building, like also Florence uh, just uh, mentioned in her conclusions. Um, integration of social democratic, social democratic and spatial data into surveillance systems and modeling should be uh, considered and promoting citizen engagement in monitoring and surveillance. For example, the mosquito alert apps uh, that uh, Florence just uh, highlighted as a sort of an active source, but we can also think about more passive ways as where people wear more wearables. Uh, these wearables, they measure all kinds of things, including, for example, resting heart rate. So if we, pull, if we can pull that data and, and put it to a certain location, we could actually potentially identify already or, or pick up an outbreak before people even feel starting sick and reporting themselves to the doctor. So, and I'll leave it to that uh, here and uh, hand it back to Yet. Um, and uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karin. This is a very comprehensive talk. There are so many things to take into account that it makes me a bit nervous. <laughs> I think uh, the audience is also digesting what you just told me. We have mainly for the time being questions for Florence, and I'm sure more will come in. Um, Florence, first a question for clarification, I think. When you said green spaces is not an option, did you mean it because it's a must, or did you mean we can't do it? <laughs> it's not an option. We cannot uh, come back uh, to, to this uh, uh, um, development. We need to yes. put uh, nature is in, within the city. Yes. It's, uh, okay. So it's, it is there. It's a must. Yeah. It, it, I ask it because there is a question. So then, what can we do? What solution <laughs> instead are... of urban green? So it, we can. It's, uh, when we are talking about uh, vector-borne diseases or arthropod, uh, we can uh, we can uh, be we can frighten uh, people. So it is not uh, our objective. We, we need mm -hmm. to, to understand, but not to, uh, to, to be uh, no. okay. too aware. Okay, I can reassure the person who asked the question. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, and there's another question about um, if, if there is anything, if you know anything about awareness of the community to this green city concept. I mean, are people aware of it and engaged? Are there any surveys about this? Is a question. Yeah, in link, link to vector bomb. 
mm, well, this green city concept already about the, the, the need, the benefits, but also the risk of green cities. Is the community aware? Are there actions to involve the community in this? And do you, are you aware of any studies on this? Ah, the, 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 there are many studies on uh, the, the link on the green cities and uh, human health. Mm. Uh, in terms of uh, mental health, uh, mm -hmm. effect on uh, respiratory diseases and so on. But, um, but all these studies uh, are difficult to compare because it is not the same protocol, it is not the same site. Mm -hmm. So that's what I say, we need to, we need to, to, to collect data yeah. uh, and to have a standardized protocol to, to collect uh, yeah. data. Okay, I think the question also, uh, focus on community awareness, like a community can contribute to making cities more green. And do you feel or do you know that there is an engagement of the community? There are uh, outreach activities to involve communities? Yes, for example, uh, urban gardening is, a, is a, gardening, an important yes. uh, community activity which is developed in many cities now. Uh, so I think, yes, uh, people are I want to be uh, engaged in the mm. in the green uh, the yes. green way. Okay, and I have an interesting question also for Harian. Why were wars and conflicts not considered as potential drivers of change? Uh, yes, that's a good question. So uh, we have uh, thought about uh, these kinds of uh, like wars that are already happening. So it's not necessarily that this would be a uncertainty to the future um, mm. because we're already seeing it happen. Uh, the, the other point, uh, one of the wild, wild card kind of pathways that were, were found in, in some scenarios was really a very big uh, world war, for example. And these are things we can consider in wild card kind of explorations. But in these scenarios, we wanted to stick with, um, because with, with not so dominant uh, scenarios. So because if you have a, a global war, that of course changes everything, right? Yes. And that will then overly dominate the scenario. Mm. So that's why we didn't specifically look at that uh, in this, in this uh, occasion. But that said, uh, if we look at, for example, big uh, natural disasters uh, and we prepare for that, um, it's similar in, in, in the streams of, of migrants, for example, which we see now, for example, around uh, Ukraine, where uh, primary healthcare facilities are overburdened and we need to spread that. So basically, you don't necessarily need to prepare specifically for one uh, specific uh, event to also be ready for similar kinds of events. Mm. So. Okay. It's very hard to see the room with the light, but if you have a question from the room, just stand up and wave your hands. There are microphones, eh? room for you yet so you ah, can see yes, more clearly. Okay. Yes, so I see a question there. Wait for the microphone, it's coming, she's running. <laughs> <laughs> so along the same lines, I'm just wondering about, did you consider cyber attacks on the healthcare system as a major risk to human health, just because I previously worked at the New York City Department of Health, and in 2018 they did a risk ranking and that came out as having the greatest risk or large-scale impact and the least easy to mitigate or to prevent. Um, so I'm wondering if you considered that too. Yeah, so one of the other drivers uh, of change uh, is uh, um, data usage. Uh, it's AI, for example, it's uh, data storage as well. Uh, so definitely part of that driver uh, is also large cyber attacks because if we increasingly digitalize everything, then of course that of course also becomes more vulnerable as a, as a consequence. Now, of course, we can't prepare for everything. And one of the reasons we're doing this exercise is that at some point we're looking at different future scenarios. We do this backcasting and we look at points and actions that are common between different scenarios. So it's really a tool to help us prioritize um, about our preparedness so we're not um, paralyzed in decision making because of all the uncertainty, but it helps to focus on our uh, our preparedness. Yeah, thanks. Good question. 
Okay. I have here a question for France. Uh, obviously, of someone who's really thinking, what am I going to do with all this information? How will this influence my work and what I have to do? And he's asking, well, urban planning is often decentralized, and so many cities are there. And then often there's also not a lot of economic influence on decisions. So, and there's so few experts to assess the risk, which is quite a complex matter, and you have to take into account so many determinants. So how to go about, would more regulation be a solution, but then do we have a regulation that fits all? Uh, it's a good, uh, good question, of course. Urban planners said that uh, there are so many regulations that it would be difficult to, uh, to add uh, mm. other regulation. So we have to, to, we have to discuss, of course. And um, it's true that uh, cities are not always uh, a lot of money to, 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 to plan uh, the, their cities, but um, they, they need to, to have uh, information about uh, the risk uh, that can be uh, considered when they, they try to green the, their city. So I think it won't be uh, a, a magic solution uh, for all the, the cities, but I think we have to, to engage a discussion with, uh, with the stakeholders and uh, uh, locally to have the, the, the state of the situation uh, where they are and uh, what can they do uh, to better uh, uh, develop the, the cities in the best uh, way. Mm -mm. Yes, I hope that answered the question. It's such a, such a difficult issue. And, and then there is another, there are two other questions. Uh, one that relates, one is Barcelona. They have this experience of uh, tr changing transport and moving away from cars and having more bike lanes, and then they got more accidents with the bikes. But of course, they had also a potential benefit, or well, not potential, they had a clear benefit on cardiovascular diseases. She asked um, if you have an idea about the risk and benefit ratio of greening. And another question relates to this, is there an opposition between communicable negative impact and non communicable communicable positive impact on the topic of green cities? Uh, Difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think there is a... They, the cities have to, to organize, to reorganize the, everything in the, in the, in the transport. Uh, so, of course, uh, I think the... As I said, in my presentation, we have to, to, to sensibilize the, the population, we have to, to communicate about uh, the, the risk, the, what they can do, and I think it's, uh, this dialogue is necessary to, to, to inform people at uh, all levels of uh, what they can do, what they cannot do, and uh, mm. to do the, the best. Uh. Yes. And perhaps we can also mitigate the negative impacts. I mean, bike accidents can be avoided by good bike lanes and traffic uh, regulations, I yes, would say. So we have also to foresee what will happen with the mitigation measures, indeed. Um, let's see if I have one. Oh, yes, there's a hand. Oh, great, great. Yes, please. Um. Thank you very much for a great uh, speech, Gavion. I was curious, in the process of um, deciding on these drivers of change, did you reflect anything on potential biases in, in the group that were, uh, were um, deciding on which ones, and like, how did you try to work with the biases of choosing some drivers of change over others? Yeah, so um, foresight methods, uh, biases is, uh, cognitive bias is very central to that. So. One of the main reasons, uh, one of the main approaches is how you try to mitigate this is by using a, a broad diversity of experts. So not just our usual uh, suspects um, and also different uh, methods. So we 
have different groups of different experts looking at the same topic from different angles. Then you have desk research taking another angle. And then we also uh, started with megatrends that have already been um, developed by the European Commission's Joint Research Center. And that's another uh, approach to come in. So basically, the, the point is to try to prevent blind spots as much as possible. And of course, there will always be bias. But as, 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 as far as you, as long as you cover most ground, um, you can't never, you know, foresee everything. But as far as you at least try to avoid the biggest blind spots, that is, um, that is one of the, the, the main uh, kind of um, um, goals of, of, the, of the methodology that you use in Foresight. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> okay. I saw another hand. Was it Ines? No? No. Oh, I was just pointing at a hand. Everybody. Yes, yes there was, please. There was one question which sort of links, and it's about mechanism for, for revisiting. Someone was saying, uh, uh, do you have a mechanism in place to reassess scenarios mm. in response to changing events? We had that question about war and conflicts, but how do you go about reassessing them and somebody else asking about do you use a statistical framework mm. when it comes to how many scenarios you're testing so uh, the first question um, um, wait l no let me let me start with uh, with the statistical uh, statistical part so from the all the drivers, we got a very big uh, um, matrix of different directions that are interlinked to each other. And actually, we started out with about 14, 15 uh, scenarios, which we then um, looked for if there are actually too much overlapping parts so we could, could actually bring them together and, and have a little bit less complexity. We don't use statistical tools for that. It's more that if you read a scenario and you can, you can think, okay, this development we can actually cover in another scenario, uh, then that's better. So six is actually already quite a lot. In most um, foresight exercises, you actually end up with four scenarios. But because public health is so inter interlinked to each other and so complex in that sense, we had to expand that. And then I, could you repeat the first question? Because I now forgot. A mechanism for reassessing ah, scenarios yeah. in light of new events. Yes, so foresight is really, it should be an ongoing process. It's uh, not that we now do this uh, exercise, this study, we finish it, we report, you know, there's a report and that will be it and maybe in five years we do it again. No, it's really, it should be an ongoing process. So it's part of a conversation that we keep doing. And already now we're looking at uh, certain drivers. Uh, are, are we missing something? Has developments in the world uh, either, you know, made a certain pathway more likely or less likely? And then you adapt along the way. So the, the project we're doing now is really to have a, a starting point, a, a common language which we can use. And basically from there have an, sort of an ongoing recurrent process where we um, where we will revisit uh, each of these scenarios and drivers uh, ongoingly. That's Thanks. Yeah. Yes, I Ines is here in the... Oh, it's not Ines, Ines is pointing again, great. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have a question. You have uh, been putting out six scenarios. So can you pick out of these scenarios all the positive things and build a scenario that gets the positive thing of every one of them together into a new one? Is that possible to do? Because they're so extreme, like you showed nature and then you showed this hard society with only young people uh, dealing with the um, um, IT things and stuff like that. So wouldn't it be better to get the good things out of each one of them? Because I think uh, each one of them had some uh, uh, things we could imagine that really would develop like this. I mean, just with common sense. Of course, we want to be greener. Of course, we need more IT, you know, whatever. So how about putting all this together and making a joint a better model than what this is really scary in some ways, what you presented. But it doesn't help us in uh, trusting into the future somehow. 
Yeah, so um, the scenarios are designed to be very distinct from each other. And that's uh, because of that reason you end up a little bit more to the extreme ends of everything. Uh, and that is, that is actually, that's fine. Uh, some people may actually consider these scenarios or one of few scenarios uh, actually unthinkable or preposterous even. But um, it's also because there is a sort of a, an end of history illusion that people think, well, we've had a lot of progress already and I think things will just continue a little bit like they're already going. And actually that is, that is what we're trying to actually get out of that way of thinking. And that's why some scenarios may actually seem very unlikely to some people, but to others they, uh, they're actually very well possible. So um, 15 years ago, for example, a lot of people I don't think thought it was very uh, likely that we would have uh, a, a volcano erupting and basically disrupting all the, all the airline traffic in the Northern Hemisphere and that had happened. Uh, war in Europe, same thing. Uh, a pandemic that basically spread ac across the world, I think also 15 years ago, a lot of people thought that was unthinkable and, and yet that happened. So uh, what I'm trying to say is also, we shouldn't be too um, conservative in our way of looking at the future. Now bringing, to get, uh, bringing these uh, different scenarios together, it's, it's a good thing uh, and that's something we should do, but mainly in the actions and steps we should take because we actually want to look at the future from these very different, very diverse angles to make sure that we don't miss uh, any uh, blind spots we may have. I hope that answers the question. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Ines Steffens, I'm the editor of Euro Surveillance. Um, I have a question because you had on your last slide, you had on the early reflection slide, you mentioned we should work closer with the cities. And I remember, uh, Florence, when we, in the run-up of the seminar, when we had our conversations on teams, you mentioned that you already work with the city, uh, with the city of Montpellier. And maybe you can give us some examples of how uh, you, in fact, and your colleagues have already some experiences from working closer with cities to uh, ensure that with the greening and with the resilience of the cities, we also prevent the effects that we don't want to have in terms of infectious disease outbreaks, for example. Thank you, uh, Ines. Well, we, we are just beginning uh, the, the project, so we have uh, one, uh, one season of uh, collecting data uh, in uh, Montpellier and in Toulouse, uh, two different cities of the Occitania region, and uh, only for, for mosquitoes. So um, we, we try to have uh, a part of uh, research on the field to, to get the data with a very uh, Defined protocols for the for the collection, and in the same time we have uh, a lot of discussion with uh, different stakeholders of the two cities, uh, of course the, the the municipalities, but also people who are involved in uh, Santé Publique France, uh, in some uh, organization that uh, have the planned surveillance in uh, at the national level, but also at the regional uh, level. And um, we try to, to discuss, uh, to, to have the, to, to raise questions, uh, what, for example, what is the risk for the municipalities? What is the risk for, uh, for me? Uh, what is the risk for someone in the, in the city who never uh, learned about uh, dengue or tick-borne encephalitis? So this is the, this kind of, uh, of discussion of, uh, brainstorming uh, on, on course that we are trying to, to do. And uh, we, we are very conscious that they, we don't have a solution at the end of the two years uh, project, but I think we, we will have some, uh, some, some, some axis of uh, research uh, and uh, of uh, development uh, of green uh, areas in the both cities of uh, Montpellier and Toulouse. Perhaps in relation to this, because it will help you, um, there is also a question about if, if are there any options to, to, to get green areas in cities without the negative 
then uh, affects on, on vector-borne diseases, or in this case, then mosquitoes, do you already have options like choice of plants or irrigation or? That, that's what, that, that is a possibility to, to, to find some uh, uh, organization of uh, plant. Uh, some, some of them are very attractive for mosquitoes, for example, so we can imagine that uh, we, we can recommend not to uh, put this kind of uh, plant uh, everywhere. But um, I think it's, uh, it's better uh, uh, a process of uh, management of the, the greening. It means that, uh, for example, uh, municipalities are engaged in uh, no insecticide on the, uh, their green areas. They have to enhance biodiversity, though, so the, the, the vegetation is still... Uh, we leave the vegetation uh, like uh, if she's high, she, it's high, it's, it's uh, short, it's short. But people are very uh, uh, not aware of that. They, they found that uh, if there is a high uh, vegetation, it's uh, dirty. Mm. So everybody has to, to change his mind uh, for, for the perception of the, of the cities and of uh, green areas uh, within the cities, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And there was another one. Yes. yes it's one question that's come into the chat, so you mm. won't have noticed it. Ah, uh, yeah. Should go in questions, not chat. But it's about you both talked about collaboration and citizen engagement. And the question is, how can we collaborate in this excellent European initiative for citizen science and community engagement for public health planning as a local public health authority? How can we join forces, is the question. Mm -hmm. Don't know whether you have any suggestions, any ideas for how to foster that collaboration. Um, so it was an early conclusion that came out of, uh, of, of expert consultations and, and it's not necessarily uh, that, that, uh, that, that this, is, this will be our focus, but it, it seems like a good idea. Um, how we can foster collaboration, um, it's exactly uh, what we're now trying to, to identify, is, is this something uh, we are not doing at the moment that we should be doing more? And uh, I can't, I mean, I think other people are better placed to, to, to discuss the details of this, mm. uh, this collaboration, but um, it's exactly identifying should we be doing this with limited resources or should we, uh, and is European level, for example, is that the, the good level to do that or is it better at local levels and should we liaise more with that? Mm. Um, and Florence, you talked about the use of citizen science and you talked about collaboration. Um, any suggestions for how uh, local public health authorities can get more involved, can join forces? Well, I think uh, the, the way is longer before we, we, we succeed in this uh, way, but I think that uh, more and more people are, are want, want to engage in the, in the, in the, from the civil society in the life of their city. So I think uh, we, we develop uh, in France a living lab, uh, which is an initiative uh, that allows to, to put together uh, people from different uh, fields and, uh, and thinking. So I think it's a... Uh, Perhaps it's little uh, initiative uh, by little initiative that can uh, go uh, and, uh, and, and away. Thank you. That's it for now yet from mm -hmm. me. Yes. And now I have another question for Florence. You, you mentioned that uh, well, we have to explore further, of course, to find ways also to prevent. And you said we need robust indicators for vector-borne diseases. What this is our field, so what indicators are you thinking about? Are you human disease or vector densities? Yes, because for, for example, uh, in, uh, with uh, the vector of uh, dengue or yellow fever and uh, all these uh, arboviral uh, diseases, for the mosquitoes, we have, uh, indi we have indicator, but we know that it is bad indicator mm. because they are not the, uh, allowing us to, to link the, diversi the, the abundance and the disease. Yes. So we have to, we have to work and to, to, to develop a better indicator, including environmental uh, indicator. I think uh, 
all the landscape metrics are very interesting and uh, perhaps some some of them are more uh, more uh, adaptable to to one mosquitoes and perhaps for an other for another species so all this work has to be done mm -hmm. look i haven't i haven't yet the, the indicator but i think we have to yes. to develop <laughs> yes. and actually the indicators we like from health surveillance will provide they come at the end of the whole scheme mm -hmm. in human disease so that's definitely not sufficient and we have to collaborate with many sectors it, it's to get good more. but uh, probably not enough in fact. Yeah, yeah. not enough <laughs> too late <laughs> too late too little any more questions in the room? No. I, I had another question with, with the first one for, there was one for, oops, where I lost yours, Gerion. No, I have to find. Oh, yes, no, there was a question for both of you. If you have any thoughts or views on the EU nature restoration law, is that having a? Not, uh, no. I, I'm not the one to speak on this, I think. No, no. you're not on okay. <laughs> those. Okay, well, I'm not either. So <laughs> we'll go to the next question. No, there is this, uh, yeah, I think it was already asked a bit by um, Ines. This collaboration with the stakeholders and policymakers, I mean, it's, uh, we are all public health people. Uh, of course, we work with them. But this is such a wide group of disciplines we have to work with. Do you have any any advices to give or any lessons learned on how to deal with this? Because it's only part of our job. And so how, how can we go about with so many people to relate with? For me, the, the important thing is to... Um to try to have uh, to understand each other mm. uh, when uh, someone is talking about uh, risk uh, everybody uh, has to know uh, what kind of risk uh, it means so i think it's a, it's a, a work uh, a daily work yes. uh, to 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 try to engage people and mm -hmm. to try to understand uh, everybody not uh, uh, I want to be a geographer or social science, I don't mm. know, but uh, I need to understand what, uh, what they say when they are talking about uh, yes. ecosystem or... Uh, and, like and perhaps what you said, to involve more cities to, or, or, or to, to work on a smaller scale. I mean, that's the importance of cities, perhaps, which makes this approach more feasible. You mentioned that in your talk. Yeah, but also uh, bringing a, a diverse group of, of, of experts together. I mean, we've seen mm. during the, the pandemic, uh, we, we've learned that having an, advice, an advisory group that is just epidemiologists, uh, some medical doctors and, yeah. and virologists, uh, it, it's not enough. And it, it's not, it's not a, a good way to, to tackle a, a, a pandemic. Um, and similarly, that's one of the things we now trying to achieve with the with the foresight program is that we exactly bring more people, different uh, experts to the table, people that from fields that are not necessarily always talking to each other or have completely different ways of working. Um, but if you um, together think about uh, future developments, it's, it's usually much easier to step over what is my daily reality and it's so different than mm -hmm. yours uh, to to think about sort of the, the, the future developments and then think your way back. So what does it mean for us and then how can we collaborate here? Yeah. So that is exactly one of the um, uh, goals we're trying to achieve with mm. the Foresight program. But it will be a long road. It's not, uh, it won't be done next year, I can yeah. tell you. Yeah. Okay, any new, nothing in the room. Uh, Jackie, did you see any new questions coming in? Not a question, but again, from the chat, in maybe the something chat, okay. we can get a comment on, which is somebody pointing to, we're talking a lot about urban greening, but there's also urban bluing, yeah. uh, giving the example of opening formerly built up river banks for recreational access or allowing swimming in urban parts of rivers and lakes. As I say, it was a comment really, because it says, but obviously this is not also without infection risks. I wonder, mm. Florence, if that's part of your... Uh, thinking whether you've looked at bluing as well as greening. 
Uh, well, blueing is also, for example, linked to, to mosquitoes. So, yes. of course, yep. uh, exactly. it's, uh, <laughs> it's a, a big uh, network of uh, different uh, infrastructure uh, within the city that has to be taken uh, mm. in, uh, t together. Uh, yes, of course. Mm. Thank you. That's it for now. I think we're, we're almost out of time anyway, but I yes. think we're done there. Yep. <laughs> Okay. Well, if there are no questions left in the room, Ines, yes. Obviously, we have thought about the topic a little bit. Also, in the run-up of our annual theme next year, which is also on changing urban environments, so the annual theme of the journal is on changing environments, we've discussed also in how far, because when, when you look there is a lot of this uh, topic uh, and a lot of activities on international, uh, from various international organizations when it comes to non-communicable diseases. So we were thinking, is, is there a role for everyone here in the group and in the room to think more about what are the impact, what is the impact which is not so evident maybe on infectious diseases and are we also called on to learn from those who have been much more advanced in their thinking because if you for example look here in Barcelona there's a big group they work with pollution they work with uh, with um, cardiovascular diseases and changing urban environments and they're big study groups and they're also the OECD has a whole study group and uh, I think there's an, a, a group a study group on on uh, changing urban environments or uh, citizens in Europe and all of them are working on non-communicable diseases so maybe uh, this is a good reason to start thinking about this not only in the future, but already now, what it means for us in our future work, and what are the tools that we need to have at hand to be able to capture the changes that may come and how we can influence them positively. Any thoughts on that? So regarding non-communicable diseases, of course, you know, ECDC is uh, working on the public health part that is infectious diseases. But that obviously doesn't mean, I mean, we've seen in the pandemic also um, uh, non-communicable diseases, obesity, for example, on those um, uh, COPD, th those kind of things, they all have an impact on the vulnerability of population. So uh, it's, we shouldn't be blind to that. And, and so we should take uh, non-communicable diseases also into account. Of course, we can't go on that full, right? Because um, we have this, we have a mandate but that doesn't mean we have to be blind to it. The other way around, of course, uh, we could also actively look for collaborations in the non-communicable disease field um, uh, and then see if they can help contribute to uh, infectious disease prevention and control. So I, I think that will can lead to a conclusion of this session. I mean, we've seen that everything is interconnected and that there is a very widespread collaboration necessary between so many disciplines and, uh, and, and, and researchers and public health workers. And well, we've been thinking about One Health, but One Health is not enough. You know, it's far beyond this <laughs> planetary health and beyond even. And I think this is the takeaway Western message that we have to find ways to, to come to all this, this widespread collaboration and find our place in this. Um, I, I wanted to end the session with this, but to remind you also that this is the annual theme of Euro surveillance, and so we are welcoming any publications which are linked to this subject, and they're warm welcome. So I would like to ask you all to think if you have any experiences or studies to share, please don't hesitate to submit to Euro surveillance. And uh, well, I would like to. Thank the speakers Thank came you, far away, uh, for wonderful presentations, very rich. And with this, I want to end this session just by reminding you still, tonight is bar camp. And I'm, I don't hear any shout this time, <laughs> but there's bar camp this evening. Well, thank you very much, and I'll close the session.